Hi there, Robert Beasley. Thank you so much for joining Hello. us for this uh, virtual forum and for, for running me. for office, putting yourself out there. We appreciate it. So um, I'm Julie McClintock, and I'm going to be asking the questions today in Virginia Long Gray will be asking the um, follow-ups and um, I'm sorry, Linda Brown will be asking the follow-ups. <laughs> Get it right, yes. And uh, we're gonna indicate uh, how long um, you have for each question just roughly and we'll signal you with a wave when you're kind of reaching the end of your time so we can keep moving and get through all the questions. Okay. So the very first one, Rob, is just to tell us in three minutes or so how long you've lived in Chapel Hill and why you are running. And if you would add to that um, any previous involvement you've had in community issues or experiences that make you a good candidate. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm, I'm a Beasley. Uh, I'm a North Carolina native. I grew up in Charlotte and I went to uh, university at uh, Carolina. So I, I was in Chapel Hill for about, I guess, seven years while I was in school and a few years um, after that, uh, Chapel Hill and Carborough technically. Um, moved to Durham and I lived in uh, Durham and Chapel Hill most of my adult life. I um, left uh, around 2010 and moved back to Chapel Hill in 2017. And so I've been here since, since then. So I've been here about four and a half, five years. Um, bought the place I'm in now in uh, late 2017. So I've been a, 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 a homeowning resident since 2018. Um, the whole time uh, I've been in the Triangle after university, I've, I've pretty much worked for an IT company uh, out of RTP, global company, uh, over 300,000 people. Um, and my focus has been on uh, IT and this design, uh, standards, regulations, compliance, governance, organizational capability. Um, and a lot of experience, <laughs> bureaucracy, a lot of experience that I think will translate well to uh, being a town council member. How much more time have I got? Like a minute? Yes. Yeah, so you could okay. take another minute to tell us what experiences yep. you think are relevant. Sure. Yep. So um, in terms of, uh, you know, community service, um, government uh, service, I, I really don't have any. I got interested in the town government um, earlier this year with the uh, J Street project. We, we got a mailing card uh, in our neighborhood for information session. We started attending that to find out about it and it left us with a lot of questions about how the site was selected. Um, and so I started attending the town council meetings and researching the town government operations uh, as part of that. And in attending those meetings, I started to see a lot of um, the behaviors and organizational and operational ways that the town government was running that didn't make a lot of sense to me and seemed to be driving uh, counterproductive uh, implementations that undermined our, our values and our, our identity in Chapel Hill. Um, and uh, so when I learned that two of the town council members that I, I really uh, admired and thought were asking the right questions and, and making fact-based decisions and voting that way weren't running for re-election, uh, I, I thought I should probably really run. Um, and it was the discussion on um, the uh, police station and their plan to turn that into a mixed use site owned by a private developer on top of a coal ash dump that really compelled me to say, I've, I've got to do this. Okay, thank you. And sure. um, so I have a quick question. In uh, recent years, um, pooled developer campaign donations have become more common. Uh, would you or do you intend to accept campaign donations from developers who do business with the town? A yes or no? No. Thank you. That was quick. All right. The next question deals with a plan for a mix of housing. 
um, a general question, your thoughts in three minutes about um, the affordable housing needs we have in our community. And then we'll have a couple of follow-ups. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think the affordable housing challenge that Chapel Hill is a, is a pretty core issue. Um, I know you're going to ask me later about the um, uh, economic uh, sustainability meeting last week and the housing report in that, which I found to be very telling. Um, and I, I had, it illustrated a lot of the problems I think we've got. Um, one of the, the things that I found in looking at J Street and one of the questions that um, you know, really raised up for me was everybody in Chapel Hill says, and, and I think most of the residents believe affordable housing is a problem. It's a challenge, we need to do something about it and we need to start providing more affordable housing quickly. But I don't see any town plans that deliver anything quickly or a really fact based on what is the affordable housing that we need, where are we going to um, either build it or acquire it? I don't see any plans for acquisition, which I actually think is important because I think that we need to have a strategy that looks at the available housing inventory in Chapel Hill and starts to um, acquire existing housing um, and make it available either as rentals or as purchases. And I know there are some programs that do that as purchases, um, but I don't know that there are any nonprofits or programs that are doing that as rentals, um, which I see as, as, as helping us to do two things. One, well, maybe three things in light of that report, but one is be able to get some affordable housing available quicker because we can do this much faster than you know, clear cut land or demo property and build something new. Um, and two, it's gonna help us to integrate the affordable housing um, residences into uh, a, a more uh, diverse demographic. It's not gonna be, uh, well, let's just build this one site and that's affordable housing. Well, just Sorry. on that question, yep. yeah. on, actually the next question, which is what are your suggestions for avoiding the displacement of low and moderate income residents and how can we ensure that when we get the additional affordable housing will be segregated? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think that the acquisition um, by the town or by the nonprofits with help in the town um, is a good way to do that because then we're able to have a strategy where we identify um, properties, residences that need to be preserved as affordable housing with um, you know, some of this in mind of, of, of trying to continue to protect it and prevent the displacement of folks that need affordable housing in these neighborhoods. Um, Okay, that's just two yeah, minutes. Yeah. And then a quick follow-up. How might conditional zoning be used effectively by the town council to further the goal of providing a mix of housing? Yeah, so, so one, of the, one of the things that um, I found as I was starting to research with the, the uh, associated with J Street was the um, conditional zoning uh, uh, incentives. And I think it's around, um, you know, it's between 10 and 15% of developments. They'll, they'll let you break the rules um, if you uh, provide 10 to 15% of, uh, of that as affordable housing. I think that's too low, honestly. I think it should be higher. Um, I think we should be looking at more of 25% uh, of these developments should be affordable housing. That would do um, a, a, a few things. One would be to continue to integrate um, economic diversity within the residences. And two, uh, it'll help to make sure that we've got a, 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 a higher percentage of affordable housing built in to the new residences and the new developments 
that um, we're, we're, we're putting up in town. Yep. Okay, I took uh, Linda's question. So I'm gonna ask the first one and Linda, then why don't you follow up with the three, we're gonna talk about a strong economy. Okay. So the first question is three minutes. Um, has the form-based code as implemented in Chapel Hill's Blue Hill District strengthened our economy? How or how not? Just three minutes for that one. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure that it has. I don't. I don't see how it has. Um, you know, I haven't had a lot of time and experience in looking at Chapel Hill's um, economic demographics. One of the things that I thought was very interesting in the um, presentation from the concern in that economic well, the housing presentation in the economic committee was how much of a dependency Chapel Hill has on the university as an employer um, and how most of the other um, businesses uh, in Chapel Hill are um, uh, retail or restaurants. And when I look at Blue Hill and when I look at the map, that uh, that consultant provided and some of the information around it, I don't see how it's a strong um, economic engine for the town because most of that area appears to be um, retail and uh, and restaurants, um, which you know are a small part of the employer base um, of the business base in Chapel Hill. Um, you know it it it. it it just doesn't seem like Blue Hill is driving a big impact there. Thank you. All right, go ahead, Linda. You're, you're up for the next three, which are two minute questions. How might conditional zoning and other policies be used to support locally owned businesses? Yeah, so, um, you know, back to the affordable housing, I think that, especially after seeing that report on Friday, um, when you look at when you look at the um, demographic of Chapel Hill, who lives here and where they work, you know you've got the university, and then the majority of our, our other local businesses appear to be retail um, or uh, 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 restaurant or um, uh, some some type of service based industry. Um, Many, and there was a comment in, in there about our retail and service-based industries tend to pay higher than others in the area, but this appears to be um, the segment where folks that are going to work in those jobs are probably not in the, you know, 150% and higher AMI. They're probably in the 100% and lower uh, AMI. And if we don't have enough affordable housing, um, we're not going to have places for people to live that work in those jobs locally. And so I think that, you know, back to my, my, my statement about we need to look at increasing um, the affordable housing requirement and conditional zoning. We need to look for ways to use the conditional zoning to ensure that we've got enough housing for folks to support these local businesses. Okay, the next question is um, the UNC Chapel Hill housing report was presented to the town council on September 10th. What lessons can we learn from the study? You've already talked about some of them. Yeah, yeah, you know, one of the things that um, as I've been, I've been back and, and watched that presentation and, and done some follow-up investigation of my own one of the things that I've seen in comments and articles that folks are posting is, well, we need to grow, we need to grow because the study said, if you look at you know, Chapel Hill compared to the growth, you need 400 residences a year to meet that growth. And I'm not sure that that is really the message and the takeaway from that developer. Um, there was a lot of comparison with Palo Alto. And when I went and looked at Palo Alto, um, it, 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 it struck me as very interesting because it's about the same size. Chapel Hill and Palo Alto are about you know, low 20s, mid 20s 
uh, square miles in size, about the same population, about 65,000, both the same density already. Palo Alto is actually a little less dense than here. Um, and, you know, Palo Alto, I'm not sure that they're really planning on uh, growing a whole lot. Um, they've got limited opportunities to grow. Chapel Hill, 20 square miles, 65,000 people, 2,900 people per square mile. We're already denser than Durham, who's been growing rapidly, maybe to catch up to us in density. So the key message there is we've really got to start thinking about how we're going to grow smartly. Um, and we really need to look at the, uh, you know, some of the economic factors that he was bringing in, that 90% of the residents here are, are working outside of Chapel Hill, right? They're leaving to go to jobs that are probably not always retail. Yep, I'm almost I think you time. have it, it. Re reversed. 90% of the people who work here don't live here. It, it, there were there were there were two there were two um, measurements in there, and I and okay. I might I have to I have to go back and look, but they mm -hmm. were there was a you know a large number a, an overwhelming population was um, that lived here uh, doesn't work here, and that do work here are commuting in, and if we don't start to look at how we grow smartly, we're going to face the same issues that Palo Alto has, where the housing prices and the, 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 um, the cost of living, you know, rents go up so astronomical that the, the people that live here aren't the people that are going to do a lot of the jobs that are necessary here for the Thank universe. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. 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 Okay. And the last two minute question in mm -hmm. that section what do we know about the cost of town services and tax revenue income of residential housing on the town's budget? That's not worded perfectly. I'll just quickly uh, correct yeah, sure. the wording. What do we know about how the cost of town services compares to the tax revenue income of, and then that one applied to residential housing? Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I haven't really looked at that. I, I don't really have a good sense of what the cost of town services um, and, uh, you know, what the implications are of um, a, a primarily residential um, tax base. I, I will say that we need to look at what our tax base is, and we need to make some real serious decisions about how is Chapel Hill going to grow? You know, I hear, I hear the current mayor and, and a lot of folks talk about, we need to bring businesses to Chapel Hill. We need to bring businesses to Chapel Hill, to the whole retail uh, or, uh, research triangle park, biotechnology. Are they coming to Chapel Hill or not? Is, is Chapel Hill really going to be a big um, business community? Or are we going to be more of a residential community? This is, you know, a lot of what I think was coming out in that report last Friday, too. And so it, it seems like we need to make a decision of what do we want the town to look like, both in terms of, um, you know, our, 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 our demographics, where our business is going to be, where, where, where is the, you know, the residential area is going to be. And then what are the services that we need to do that? And then how are we going to pay for it all? And, and I, you know, maybe this plan exists, maybe this vision exists, but I, I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. Very good. All right, on to um, the next topic, which is green infrastructure. And this is a big question to handle in three minutes, but we want to know your thoughts about what are your priorities for green infrastructure for the town. And we're gonna include such things as parks, tree canopy, transit, stormwater control, greenways and green spaces. Yeah, so, so I, those things are all very important uh, to me personally. Um, 
I, uh, when I moved here, one of the things that I love about uh, Village West and where I am is I'm right next to Umstead Park. Um, I use the Tanyard uh, Greenway Trail every day. Um, I use the bike lanes uh, to get out into uh, the county to be able to, to cycle. I've used Carolina North um, for mountain biking. Me personally, they're important. And I think that one of the reasons um, folks come to Chapel Hill and choose to live in Chapel Hill um, is for those types of uh, natural, uh, preserved, um, uh, <laughs> conservation, uh, sites and, and, um, parks, uh, that's a big draw community. So protecting them and coveting them, investing in them is important to me. Um, I was on the Monday session with, uh, the, the Booker Creek group and I and I took a tour on Wednesday of that site and it was really mind-blowing to me on a on a couple of levels one I went and read the town's um uh climate change response plan and you know there's a lot of stuff in there but and and, and climate change is important to the town and when I replay the messages from the last election candidates, you know, all the ones that got to one of their top two things they said was climate change. But then you go and you look at this um, water basin plan where they're going to clear cut almost 50 acres of tree canopy and um, <laughs> natural habitat for wildlife and nature's uh, best um, <laughs> water uh, handling uh, capabilities. It just, it just didn't make any sense to me. And okay, we so have, we have a follow yeah. up on that. Go ahead, Linda. Um, what are your ideas for how the town council might direct the use of open tracts of land, such as Legion Road, East Town, the Green Tract, and J Street? Yeah. So I I think I think that we have to focus on preserving the open space land that we've committed to preserving. Um, you know, J Street, for example, much of that parcel was purchased with open space bond funding from in the early 2000s, which was presented to the town as, you know, we're going to use this money to buy open space land and preserve it as open space and make it available for open space in perpetuity. So we kind of set this expectation and now to come back and say, oh, but we're not really going to preserve all of it. We need to use it for something else. While legal seems unethical um, and, and also in a lot of ways seems counter to the climate change response plan um, and, and our other priorities. So I think that we you know, look at these open space lands and figure out how do we use them to best achieve and, and, and protect the goals of our climate change response while also providing um, additional areas and facilities for residents to use like greenway trails, like parks, what have you. Yes. Okay, so there's another another part, mm -hmm. um, and you touched on it a little bit. How might the town's climate action plan be revised to address short-term achievable goals? And give an example. Yeah. So I so I I had never read the climate change action plan um, until you guys told me you were going to ask about it. So I've only recently discovered it. Um, and there's some stuff in there with, you know, things they want to do, changing the ordinances, coming up with stuff. Um, I, I didn't necessarily see any of the things that came out of the um, uh, Booker Creek uh, groups set of these are actions that we should take right away. And those seem like a reasonable <laughs> set of actions that some, if not all of them, we should be taken right away. Be taken right away. 
So number one, I think the town should start looking at incorporating those. Number two, I think that the town has got a, one of the things I didn't see in that action plan was, and these are the things that we've got underway that don't make sense anymore and we should stop doing, like the watershed projects. I, it started to draw into mind, you know, a question for me of how many of these projects and initiatives does the town have underway that are actually going to undermine that climate change plan? And one of the things that I think we need to do actionable is look for those, identify them, and stop them so that we're going backwards. Good. All right. All right. Um, what pedestrian and bike improvements would you prioritize? Two minutes. Yeah. So um, I certainly think that pedestrian and bike improvements are um, important and necessary. One, because I, <laughs> I am both a pedestrian and a cyclist. I, I think that we've got to look at where people live in Chapel Hill and where they work and where they're going to and in and and identify the routes that have the most we'll call it unnecessary car traffic car traffic that would more likely be um, displaced if it was easier to bike or to walk and we should make those a priority because Everyone says we should be driving more. It's good for the environment. It's good for the climate. It lowers CO2 levels. It lowers pollution. But the thing that we have to do is we have to recognize the way to do that isn't by making it harder to drive. It's by making it easier not to drive. And if we start to come up with bike trails and, um, and pedestrian uh, projects that achieve that for areas where it's likely that you're not going to have to drive if you use the bike trails, use the, the pedestrian walkways. I think we'll get more bang for our buck quicker. Yeah. Okay. So moving on to public mm -hmm. engagement, which of course is important. <gasps> um, this is really a question about town planning. So if you would um, give us your opinion in three minutes. So the town council and staff had have sponsored many outreach planning exercises and they have adopted town plans reflecting a great deal of public engagement. How would you be guided by these plans as you make land use decisions? Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that, um, one of the things that I uh, found in attending the town council and um, listening to the public engagement is I, I don't know how well the town council is doing with really listening to what the public is saying um, and, and giving answers to what the public is asking for. Um, you know, projects like Aura, <laughs> projects like J Street. Um, I hear a lot, and 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 projects like the 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 watershed um, uh, initiative. You know, I, I hear things that you know the community is finding about these things too late. They've already left the gate. They're already far down the road. Public involvement seems to be delayed. I hear tons and tons and tons of public on these calls, getting their two minutes each to talk when a developer has been given an hour, an hour and a half. And it seems like it falls on a lot of deaf ears. Um, I hear a lot of rumbling of, you know, we didn't know there's not much transparency. I don't know that the town is really listening to the public. And I think that's part of the problem. Okay. Okay. Follow-up question. How will you handle citizen requests and comments? What efforts will you make to increase public engagement, especially with marginalized communities, to meet the needs of residents? Yeah, so um, that, 
That is a good question, and for <laughs> for a number of reasons, um, I've I've had a couple of discussions with folks that represent the marginalized communities. And when I moved to Chapel Hill, um, I rented a room on the cheap uh, in a, a, a lower income neighborhood with a lot of folks that weren't connected and plugged in to how the government works or how things are communicated or how to get their needs across. I don't get the sense that there is enough um, outreach from the town council to go into these groups and really solicit and try and get responses. I, I, I look back at the, um, the MLK project with the mobile home park and you know, I, I, I'll be honest, I've, I've only started to learn a little bit about what happened, but it seemed like the town was caught on its heels. It didn't know in advance, the, the town government, I should say, I think a lot of people in town knew, the government didn't know and didn't have the foresight of what was coming. Um, and it resulted in uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of very vulnerable people um, being put through a lot of uncertainty and stress that they probably well, that they certainly didn't need, um, and the town having to make compromises that were completely contrary to the plan, completely contrary to the town goals. And so we've got to do a better way of either going into these communities directly or going to the groups that really represent them on a regular basis and, and figuring out ways to be more proactive and come up with programs to help protect those communities and, 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 and figure out how to get the services to them that they need. Thank you. So the final question, and we may take a few more if we have time from folks that are attending the call, but uh, the final question is two parts. One is give an example of a town council decision that you agreed with and why you agreed. And the second one, of course, is one, which one you disagreed with and how you would have handled it better. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, so one that I agreed with was the decision to approve the putt-putt um, and storage site that's up, uh, up in LK near, near, near 40. Um, and I agreed with it because I think we need storage um, based on my personal experience um, of trying to find storage in my relocation up here and how hard it is to get. And I also think we need entertainment um, opportunities like putt-putt, like the go-karts, and I like go-karts. And the town made some decisions with that developer based on you know location that's already near 40, which is louder. They made the go-karts be electric, so it's more environmentally friendly. It, it seemed like to me, as I was watching it over the, I think it was in two of the town council or board meetings that I saw, um, it seemed like a, a case where they shepherded in the right direction to get the town some things that we need without undermining a lot of our other plans. Thank you. So yeah. if you could turn to one that you uh, disagreed with, and how you would have handled the latter. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's, been a, there's been a lot of <laughs> stuff that I disagreed with. Um, the, the most recent, um, well, I guess that's not really a town council meeting. The one that, the one that um, really threw me, that got me um, engaged, and I can't remember if I mentioned this on this, on this discussion before, was the police station and on top of the coal ash dump and the town's decision to um, one of the, or two of their three options is to sell the property to a private developer. And at least one of those options is for that site to become a mixed use site. 
which means residential. And it just seems completely irresponsible to me for the town to, number one, not clean up a site that's going to be residential, but number two, give it to a private developer who we've all seen, they're really only interested in maximizing their profits and doing the meets minimum for, for, <laughs> for things that uh, regular people need. Um, and putting a lot of folks at risk, it, it just seems very irresponsible to me. So that, that and, and that was really, when I learned about that, that was really the, one of the things that, one of two things that compelled me to, to run for office. So Rob, if you were a council member now and that decision were um, in front of you, what would you have advocated? Well, I certainly would advocate that the site needs to be revisited. Um, in terms of what the town's future plans are for it. I certainly would have advocated that if you're going to not clean up the coal dump, but go down your risk mitigation path, you need to make the decisions of how the town is going to use that property um, and then put in place your risk mitigation plan with that use in mind. What they're, what they're doing right now is they, they appear to be going down a path that says, okay, we're gonna do risk mitigation, we're gonna do a study, but it's not taking into account the way the site's used today is a, you know, a, a police station, a public office building. There's not a lot of foot traffic. Hmm. I'm sorry, I muted you for a minute, Robert. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I, I thought I'd run over my time. <laughs> no, I was inadvertent. I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. That's I, I was okay. trying to open up for in case there were questions from others, but did you get to finish your thought on that? I well, I I I, I mostly did. I don't know if you heard the end of it, but yeah. Um, I, I think uh, you could ask me a follow up question on it if, all right. if, if, I, if all it right. didn't let's, sound like I said something. Let's see if there are other questions now. We have a few minutes. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start, Robert. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. We have a, um, a, a number of, um, of very fresh faces running this time around. Um, often we have several, you know, incumbents, but this time we have one incumbent. Yeah. Everybody else is everybody else is fresh, and and by net by definition, many of them uh, don't have much experience in, in government. Perhaps they've uh, served on some councils or or, or those things, um, but they each bring a, a unique perspective and a neat unique um, you know set of tools. Um, and so, I, I guess what I'm I'm trying to understand is is you know what what is the uniqueness that you bring. What, what, you know, some, some people might bring environment, some people might bring, you know, expertise in affordable housing, economic expertise, you know, data science, that kind of thing. What do, what do you see that your unique tools that you would, you would offer the, the council? Yeah, so, so I think that my experience um, in that IT company um, is unique among the candidates and the town council. And to be more specific, I've got a lot of experience in working within a large bureaucracy to understand what are really the, the goals that you have. What's the future vision that you wanna to get to? Defining a strategy that gets you there. Translating that strategy into a set of standards, requirements, initiatives that gets you there. Looking at your organization and understanding organizationally, are you enabled to make those things happen? And if not, what changes should you be making to do so? And then operationally over time, governing and managing to make sure that you're hitting the right targets, that the changes that you've made um, are, are working, and then 
course correct very quickly. Um, one of the things that I've, I've done in the last five to seven years is start to focus more on a methodology called Agile, um, which allows you to do things quicker and it, it gets away from waterfall methodology. If, if I don't know how many of you understand that. I don't have the time to, to fully explain it. But when I look at how the town is operating today, particularly with development projects, it seems like it's a, a very, you know, waterfall type of idea. They take years to go through um, the process for development. And there's all this discussion of, um, and I'm probably starting to get into the weeds. There's a lot of discussion and I hear the town councilors say, we need to make it faster. We need to make it easier on developers. It's a real shame to get to the end of all this and the developers, you know, we have to tell them no. And while I agree with that, I think that they're missing the point of, they need to be able to tell developers no sooner Mm -hmm. When something obviously doesn't meet the town's needs, when it obviously is counter to the town's goals, when it obviously doesn't follow the town's standards, and not spend two years of staff time who could be working on other stuff, helping the developer get everyone's you know, mindset around all these rules they're going to break, and that that's okay and get us off track. Appreciate and I have a lot that, of experience Bob. with that. Yeah, thank you. So let's just see if there's any more questions and we're close to wrapping up. No, I'm good, thanks. Okay, Virginia. Linda? No. Okay. Good. Well, okay, well Rob? thank you very much, Rob. Thank you yeah, very much. Thank you. We appreciate you joining us and delightful My to see a picture of you and good luck. Thank thanks you. so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. <laughs>